You know the day destroys the night Night divides the day Try to run, try to hide Break on through to the other side Break on through to the other side Break on through God bless America. Welcome to The Ranch, everybody. The podcast explores the people and happenings of Dry Creek Ranch, Eagle, and the greater Boise area. This is the second installment of the Eagle City Council interviews. I did offer interviews to all five candidates, but Mary May did decline. Now, the ground rules were, of course, no one knew what questions I was going to ask, and I did not publish any of the interviews until all of the other interviews were done. And by doing this, I was sure that there was going to be no contamination of information. I do greatly appreciate the candidates taking the time to come out and talk to me. Obviously, they did not have to. This podcast is brought to you by Old State Saloon. I love this spot. They just remodeled it a few months back. They have wonderful live music. They have wonderful beer on tap. And the setting itself is just fantastic. Go down, check it out, have a drink, and enjoy yourself like I always do at Old State Saloon. My guest today is a lifer with Idaho. She was born and raised here has moved around a little bit, but has lived in Idaho the majority of her life. She moved into Eagle from Meridian and loves it here. But there are some things that she sees that are not quite going the right direction with the city and some things that she really feels like could be improved upon. So she's running for city council. And I'll stop talking so you can hear what she has to say. Without further ado, the woman, the myth, the legend, Christina Patterson. It's pretty fun. Christina, here we are. How are you? Dude, I'm amazing. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing swimmingly. Thank you so much for coming. I know you got kids and you got people you care for. So thank you for making the time. I appreciate you having this platform for me, but also for everybody in the community. Like like I told you earlier, it's just so important for us to get to hear from the candidates. And we don't have that opportunity or that platform really. So thank you for opening up your time and home. Absolutely. The Boise Dev. Okay. So Boise Dev obviously does interviews with, with mayoral candidates and, and whatnot. And I reached out to them and I said, look, I'm doing the exact same interviews you're doing, except I'm not, it's it's not the written word, right? I have these long form video podcasts. I have a full studio. Like, why don't we collaborate? I mean, if there is certain questions or, or sets of ideas you want me to address, I can absolutely do that. But like, I think people really enjoy consuming video and small clips. And then you have, you know, stuff that hangs out there forever, but they have not gotten back to me. It is what it is. I appreciate you reaching out to them. Collaboration is a great word. I'm glad you used that. So talk to me. You have your whole life to be going after. And here you're just smashing your head against a brick wall campaigning to be on the city council. Why are you doing this to yourself? That's a great question. (laughs) Um, I'm a fourth generation Idahoan. I've lived here my whole life other than when I went away to college. Um came back and lived 15 years in Meridian, had two kids, awesome husband. We could walk to eight parks. I could walk to the library. I could walk and get coffee. I could walk to get the groceries. Um, But we saw the writing on the wall as far as my family. So my mom and dad take care of my brothers and uncle who have an intellectual disability. My parents were aging. We said we need to get a bigger home because we're going to have them come live with us. So we looked around Meridian, couldn't find anything that would be big enough. So we looked in Eagle, and can I be honest, I was scared to move to Eagle. I mean, (laughs) it has a reputation of being a very rich, posh place, and I'm a small-town Idaho girl. But we found a great house. We moved in. We moved everybody in, and I've loved it. We can walk our kids to school. I know more neighbors by their name in the six years I've lived there than I did in the 15 in Meridian. And it was just magical. Uh, My mom could drive to get her nails done. She could get her hair done. She could go to the senior center. My kids and I could walk to school. In the last couple of years, that's all changed. My mom no longer has the senior center. My kids' school has doubled in size from 300 to 600. Traffic, as you know, is piled up to Floating Feather Island to 55. They don't have playgrounds. Just so many things were changing. And it impacted my family directly. And I didn't see anybody talking about families in that way at city council. I heard a lot of things about development and growth, but I didn't hear anybody actually listening to how those decisions impacted families. So I said, it's it's time that we get somebody on on the council who's going to listen. And that's what I bring. I'm I'm a social worker. I collaborate with people. I don't want to control anything. That's, I hear that word tossed around a lot. We have to do this so we can control it. 
I don't see the world that way. I don't see an us versus them. I see all of us. We're a community. We're all neighbors. When in, what happens out here in Dry Creek happens to me in my area. So I wanted to run to, to bring that collaborative effort to the city council. Okay. So you're living Meridian and you just have like this fairy tale life where you're literally walking everywhere. You have parks, you have everything. What, I mean, that, that seems like a completely different Meridian than I've, than I have experienced. And I've only been here since, you know, the beginning of 22. So this is why I'm asking. People always talk about growth impacting and changing their lives. Like that doesn't sound like the town that Eagle or Meridian that I've experienced, frankly, like that I don't see, you know, obviously Reed Merrill Park is awesome, but that's, you know, on a kind of a main drag. And, uh, you know, there there are no real effective walking parks that, that I know of. Everything's kind of getting pushed, pushed out to the, to the fringes of the city. Mm-hmm. What was Idaho like before this big population boom? Well, mind you, we've had a lot of booms throughout the years. I think the last one in the last four or five years has felt different, and I think it's because it's felt urgent and quick. Whereas before, when we had the booms, it felt more continuous with the vision of Idaho, which, you know, like I said, I've only lived here. I lived in Montana. Both those places are outdoor. And so everywhere I've lived in Idaho, you could just walk out your front door and go hiking, biking, fishing. You can do all the outdoor stuff. I didn't have to load up the car and drive for three hours to get to Somewhere like McCall, you can just do it outside your back door. So I don't know, to answer your question, it's always been a place where you could walk. And so it's weird to be stretched so thin. Gotcha. Now, th- this is actually a big uh, a big sticking point in with, with the opinions of some of the mayoral candidates, specifically um, uh, former Mayor Ridgeway. He... He very much thought that West Park was a very, very important um, addition to the city because he felt that, look, we need something that's accessible, right? We need something people can ride their bikes to. We need something that that people can walk to, the, you know, dog park and whatnot, because things are becoming like driving only, mm-hmm. right? And, it, and that's not great. And there is some discussion about, okay, well, or excuse me, there was some discussion about, okay, yeah, you need something in walking distance, but floating feather is already, already stuffed with people. We can't get rid of people. I mean, I hope not because I love it here, <laughs> right? We can't stop the people that have moved here. I don't think we're going to be able to stop people from moving here in the future. So talk to me about proximity to amenities like parks, like small commercial. What do you see the city council doing that, or the city in general that you don't think is correct or do you think that they're trying to address these things they're just not doing it fast enough or they might be doing it well you can compliment them but what is that for you this podcast is brought to you by mtustudios.com if you're looking to start a podcast or make content for any level of your business mtu studios can help just reach out to us today and we can start shooting tomorrow that's a good question there's a lot to that um i do agree that we should have had a west park because it, we don't have any parks on that side of town. And yeah, Floating Feather is getting busier. And I saw what Cherry Lane happened in Meridian. It went from a two lane to now it's five lanes. And I don't want that to happen at Floating Feather because I love the trees and I love the burns. And you can't expand that road right. without getting rid of that. But it would have been great to have a more of a discussion on that West Park. They didn't have any public hearings that I went to or got to hear about. I know that when I reached out to city council saying it was a great thing, only one council member even contacted me back. Nobody else did. So that felt a little disheartening. I would like to see Parks and Rec have more opportunities for all kids in the whole area. I grew up in a time where I could play softball and baseball. So I guess that's the same. Softball, basketball, track, all that through the rec. And it was low stakes. I didn't have to worry about competing and traveling all over. I could just go and play and have fun. And I think we're missing that. I'd like to incorporate more of those kind of just go out and play type of things rather than competitive sports. I wish that we had more parks. I hesitate because I would, what I'm trying to say is when we have parks, it is a priority because it's a safety issue. 
we talk a lot about, oh, we need to have the police contract and we want to be able to call the cops and them show up when we want. And that's cool. I want to be able to call the cops and they'll be there when I want them there. But what's even better is if I never have to call the cops. And the way to do that is to build up these communities. And you build up communities by having parks, by having senior centers, by having recreational activities, by having arts available to people, having things to do, and having people feel vested in their community. And that West Park incident didn't feel like the community even had a vested opportunity to talk about what that meant to them. A lot of my mom friends, they travel all over the valley to get their kids to soccer and to basketball. Why can't they just do that here in Eagle? And did they get a chance to go and talk to city council and discuss that? Did they come up with problem solving for the traffic issue? Obviously not. And we're gonna have, we're just moving the traffic out now, rather than keeping things where you can bike to it. Gotcha. And and again, a couple things that you're touching on. Um, the first is really something I've heard a lot that public sentiment it is not with feeling like individuals are being heard. It's not. It sounds that the population of Eagle really feels like, look, why even show up these days to to town council meetings? They're not listening to us. And obviously, you had the you had the incredible display of public participation with the Avamore hearings, and people people were overwhelmingly the the people who physically showed up were overwhelmingly uh, against the against annexing Avamore in. What do you think about that? Like, how did we come to that? And when we're done with that, <laughs> I should write this down. But I want to hear more about your sentiment with, look, engagement and and helping the population not fall into essentially disrepair and scurrilous behavior, right? Through engagement, senior engagement, youth engagement, uh, again, really making a community that produces better people overall and will have less crime. But again, let's start with... Let's start with the the public being heard. You feel like the public is not being heard by the town council or even considered. Correct. And you mentioned it spot on with the Avamore. All the folks that showed up, not all the folks, but the vast majority of folks that took the time out of their day to show up and talk said no. And yet the council voted yes. And the thing we heard over and over again was they want to be able to control what's happening out there. Not once did I hear them say, hey, let's collaborate with the Eagle residents already, let's collaborate with Avamore, let's figure out some sort of combination that will work for all of us. That wasn't even discussed. It was all about control. And if you look at the Sunshine Fund on who is backing the people that were on the council and the mayor, they were all supported by people with a lot of money that were associated with developments, that are associated with people I know nothing about. You look at my sunshine, it's all $20, $50 of donations from people here in town because they know that I'm going to be their voice. I'm not going after developments. I'm not looking to get a contract at the end of this. I'm not trying to move up in some sort of political place. I just want to bring voices to the table. And I don't think on the city council many people asked questions to the mayor or to themselves. There was just a lot of yes, we'll do whatever you want, Mayor, and not, well, let's listen to the community. And when I've gone to the city council meetings, I've been in a lot of different meetings in my life and <laughs> with a lot of different people of a lot of different power, and not once did I feel the animosity that I felt when I went to those city council meetings. It was, it was really rough to watch that, and it didn't feel kind. But did you... Did you watch or hear the meeting from the uh, earlier this week? It's Friday, right? So there was a meeting on Tuesday. I was in that meeting. Man, I was not present, but I saw clips of it. I was like, holy guacamole. <laughs> we don't have to agree on everything, but we should be kind. And it, it didn't feel like a very kind atmosphere. Or respectful, to be honest. The... the, the Quickness with which people throw away individuals' perspectives or intelligence is, is I think, really unfortunate because it's kind of like, look, hang on, hang on, hang on. Maybe we just disagree. You know, and anybody who's been married <laughs> or has a partner for any period of time, it's like, okay, I'm not dumb because I don't, you know, do this with the towels, right? Like, I, we're just, we have different perspectives on towels, apparently, or it's just something dumb, right? 
and again, it's not you don't have to be married to the to your fellow councilman or the mayor or something to just I don't know. It, it really shocked me that that things were getting so kind of nasty in the meeting. No, yeah. it was sad. So since we're on the topic, and I do want to hear about the park thing, since we're on the topic, what do you think about Avonmore? I love the people out there. I love the community. I think it's super cute. Um, I'm terribly concerned about a lot of things with it. Okay, hit me with the terribly concerned because I agree. People up there are great. Some of my some of my kids' best friends live up there. I think the community is super cool. I mean, the the whole bit. But them becoming part of Eagle and how that happened, all of that hit me. Even if it didn't become part of Eagle, just it being there concerns me because it's going to be lit on fire at some point. It's in the foothills. All my buddies from college and high school worked for BLM and fought fires. It's just a matter of time when there's going to be a wildfire up there. So do we have the resources? Do they have the resources to be safe against fire with police? We're in a desert. Do we have enough water out there? How do we deal with the sewage on that? So I start thinking about the resources and what's going to happen. How do we protect them? How do we get them the things that they need? And whether that's they're because they're part of Eagle, whether it's because they're their own town, it doesn't matter. We're we're all going to the same schools. We're all shopping in the same places. We're all neighbors. We need to take care of each other. So the resource element is what concerned me more than even the annexation piece. Because it, the annexation felt like an us versus them versus a, hey, how are we going to make it so that they have a great community, a great life, and they're our neighbors. Let's take care of them. I, that's, that's what irked me the most about it. That you felt that it became present residents of Eagle versus the Avamore residents. And, but what would, I don't think there was tension there between the Eagle residents and the Avamore residents. Oh, good. <laughs> I don't know where the tension is. I, break it down for me because I just felt tension about annexation. Well, I think it was my understanding, and again, I don't live in Eagle, but it was my understanding from talking to people that do live in Eagle. They're like, look, what's the benefit for us? We have a resource drain. We have a uh, uh, a problem. As somebody put it online, they're like, look, Avamore is our baby now, and we have to deal with the baby, right? But, like, why did we have the baby, right? What, what was the value here? So I don't know that there was, from a populist standpoint, any animosity from, like, an Eagle resident to an Avamore. I mean, they were not fighting with each other. The, the question was, why is the city council taking the steps that they are? Right, that that, and I think the animosity, at least that is my understanding, was from Eagle residents with the town council. I think you're right. That nails it down a little bit better, as far as, and I guess the animosity there is that the town council didn't hear what the residents were wanting, and also the residents didn't hear get to hear the benefits of what the council was trying to push for with annexation. All we heard was control, control, control. Would what does that mean? What are we actually controlling? What are we getting out of this? Right. Um, there is. There was some discussion. Mayor Pierce did talk about being able to reduce density to ensure that it doesn't, uh, you know, become like a hyper hyper dense area where people are coming down and and using our services. That eventually, or they do, we do get tax benefits, obviously, um, for the city of Eagle. But uh, Mayor Ridgeway did point out very quickly that it's just it's not going to break even. Right. I believe it was Mayor, uh, excuse me, former Mayor Ridgeway saying that from a financial standpoint, they're not going to generate enough tax revenue for years to actually pay, be self sustaining, um, a self sustaining arm of the city. So a little out there. So in your opinion, if you had, if you were on the city council at that point, did you hear enough compelling evidence to say, okay, yeah, we should annex them in, or we need to hold off on this? I would have held off. I, I didn't hear enough of what would benefit Eagle from it. And not that I look at life as tit for tat, what are we going to benefit each other? That whole mind frame isn't how I think, so it's hard to think that way. I think more of how can we help each other and what sure. is it that you need, Avamore? What do we need, Eagle? We need access to the foothills. I love to hike out there. So can I still have access to that? And Avamore, do you have all the resources you need to have what – you know, the schools are a big deal. Did they have a school built out there? Are they going to be using my schools? And if so, are we accounting for the traffic on that? And have we talked to West Ada? Was there a collaboration between them and the City of Council and Avamore talking about all this? There's a lot of partners that needed to come to the table. Right. And 
I think your point is well made that it doesn't have to be an adversarial tit for tat, us versus them, what do I get out of this? But I, would you agree that the city council obviously has a fiduciary duty and a stewardship duty to the existing residents? So it's like, listen, I may love Avamore completely, but I represent a specific constituency and how does this benefit them? Because I can't just do it on morality. Like, I don't want to leave my neighbors hanging, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, what about this person who elected you? Do they want it? So I get I get what you're saying. Um, let's come back to the park. So your idea, which I haven't heard people express before, is look, we need to, yeah, fine, law enforcement is fine. But if we just, I think what you're saying is if we just focus on law enforcement, we're going to miss the larger issue. We're going to be hitting people you know, over the head with a hammer instead of offering them incentives and other alternatives to getting into mischief. Is that is that what I'm understanding? Oh, absolutely. We can look at any number of evidence-based studies about communities and what has happened. The more opportunities you give families, children, the less opportunity they have to commit crimes and mischievous behavior. So yeah, I absolutely think that the best way to have a wonderful community is to create those opportunities where people feel vested, where they hear, feel heard, where they have something fun to do and, and want to be there. Right. Now, it, as far as um, criminal activity, and people have been very concerned about it because it has been increasing, and um, I believe Brad Pike pointed out that, look, we had all of the worst things from a, from a, a crime perspective that, that, you know, murders and stuff that, yeah. that you could get. He was, he was quick to point out, look, you have to be a deterrent. So it's all well and fine to keep the residents of Eagle happy and, and out of mischief. But the people that are doing the crime, that's not necessarily locally sponsored crime. The, those are groups coming through or, or uh, people coming from, not, not even statewide groups, just people coming from other, other surrounding areas. What do you think about that? Do you think that, that the nature of, of said crimes warrants greater police protection and first responder resources? Or do you think that it's, hey, we should really focus on our citizens primarily? Oh, I'm not against police. We definitely like having them around. I know that when they're present at our school, people definitely behave different. <laughs> so I guess I don't under. I just went blank when you were out talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> the coffee hasn't kicked in, yeah, I guess. <laughs> drinking that. But again, my th th there are two factors, right? Like making up or helping your existing population have things to do so that you don't have teenagers and stuff sure. getting into trouble. And then stopping other people from coming in. Um, well, let me let me rephrase this. At the meeting on, on Tuesday, one of the big issues was funding the $506,000 to hold the status quo and then another roughly $300,000 to hire on two more deputies to the, um, to the Eagle Police Department that's run by the sheriff. Yeah. What do you think about bringing on the additional two deputies? Do you think that's sufficient or do you think that we should have more people in the near future? Well, I would have to defer to the sheriff. They are the ones that are in charge of this. They have their expertise. You talked earlier about, you know, we have experts in our fields. I am not a police expert. I don't know what crime is happening. I don't know what we would need to help counter that. But I did read Sheriff um, Clifford's letter. I saw him on your podcast. It sounds like he's got some great ideas, and it sounds like the negotiations kind of fell flat. Um, that's where the collaboration piece comes. Like he's the expert in that field. Like he needs to be telling us what he sees that, that we can do to keep our community safe. We listen to that. We use our reasoning. We question it. We say, okay, does that really fit with what we're seeing here on the ground? And then kind of take his advice on what we need. So no, I'm not against adding more. I think we should definitely talk to those who are in the know and take their take their lead on that. Gotcha. And yeah, Sheriff Clifford's great. Very, very bright guy. I love, every time I speak with him, I'm, I'm very pleased. And I learn, I learn a bunch. Um, so let's talk about expansion then. A lot has been talked about, as you're even pointing out. Look, school's doubling in size. Traffic going bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> and what do we do? Like, what does the city of Eagle do to help manage all of this? Because it's a great spot 
right? Obviously, I love this area. Mm -hmm. What do we do, though, to address the ever-growing population and not combat the population growth, but combat the lesser positive fallout? Right. We have how many highways going right through Eagle here? I think there's four. So obviously, talking to Ada County Highway District is huge. And a couple of the meetings I saw that didn't seem like there was much discussion between the two groups and collaboration again between, okay, we're going to put a development here. Maybe we should have the roads ready before we put in 800 homes. So my biggest thing would be talking more to the road IDT, ACHD, asking them what we can do forward thinking. I'm tired of building a road and then three years later, digging it up and having to redo it. The corner of Eagle and State is a great example. We've dug that up, I think, three times (laughs) in just the last seven years or something and every time you do construction that puts us behind the ball again so let's get it right the first time we know the growth's coming it's not going to stop so let's plan for it and and make it happen in a positive way rather than playing catch up all the time to that end the growth is going to happen and i i get what you're saying about traffic like let's let's make instead of putting band-aids on it or you know just trying to smooth it over plan ahead what do we do with housing because a lot has been talked about developing and growing the Eagle Way, right? Uh, former Mayor Ridgeway uh, took a huge hit in 2019 for what people thought were his his apartment projects. And he it was responsible for approving and pushing through one apartment complex, but then other apartment complexes that happened during his tenure as mayor were approved years and years prior. People are really hot about apartments, though. Uh, hot it's a hot button issue right they either love them or they hate them most people are like ah, apartments how do we find housing and i'm not saying quote unquote affordable housing right categorically but how do we alleviate the burden with housing for wonderful residents who do want to live here is it is it offering them more affordable ownership options like townhouses and condos is it changing the zoning so we have single family homes with smaller lot lines and smaller lots in general or is it doing uh, apartment style things where you don't have uh, a piece of ownership but you know they're small enough and we can absorb you know 20 early 20 year olds or young couples or singles like that yes to all of that <laughs> <laughs> we need all of it we're a diverse community we need diverse housing options so i moved my mom in with us a couple of years ago she was in jerome idaho a uh, small, awesome town, moved to Eagle, thought it would be a nice, small little town. She could get around, get her nails done, get her hair done, go to the senior center. It proved that she needed her own independent living place. But it had to be somewhere close because every time the sound bar on the TV got turned off or the wrong button got hit, we'd have to go over and fix it. <laughs> so I wanted her to the have... The sound bar. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear anything. <laughs> Like, you just have to hit the circle with a line, Mom. Just hit the circle. Dude, IT yeah. with Mom on the phone is – it's a saint's job. Yeah. I had to explain to somebody the other day um, over the phone how to open the Apple Podcast app, and, and it, was, it was a thing. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> no, so yeah, I was running over to my mom's house in Jerome every other day to fix things, and we moved her up with us. We thought this would be great. She could live with us. She needed her own independent place, so we started looking for somewhere where a 78-year-old woman could live independently in Eagle. So I could go over and fix her soundbar, open up internet, whatever, and not have to drive all the way. So she needed an apartment, is what I'm saying. We couldn't find one, not one that would fit her price budget, not be able to give her all the amenities she needed. So now she's living in Boise. So now I'm driving to Boise to fix her soundbar. <laughs> but we people want to poo-poo on apartments for a lot of reasons they think it's going to bring in crime or people that don't fit the eagle image i don't fit the eagle image i'm a small town girl who grew up in a trailer and here i am living in the richest zip code in idaho and i don't think that we should ostracize somebody just because of how much money they make i don't think that you should criminalize somebody because they can't afford to live here we need apartments for people like my mom We need apartments for people in transition that move up and they don't know where they want to build their house. So I'd like apartments for them. There's all kinds of businesses around here that need employees and they don't want to have to drive from Nampa into here because, again, that adds to the traffic problem. So I'd rather have people live and work here 
And so apartments, townhouses, that's all great. I do think it needs to be handled in the appropriate places with the appropriate sizes. I think having large lots are awesome. I have friends who have horses and it's great to go out there and enjoy that. Um, and I don't think that the horse place should be right next to a townhouse. There needs to be some common sense there. So yes to all the housing options. It just needs to look in the and be in the right place at the right time. This podcast is brought to you by mtustudios.com. If you are looking to start a podcast or make content for any level of your business, MTU Studios can help. Just reach out to us today and we can start shooting tomorrow. I like that you brought that up because there, much, like I said, much has been made over apartments, but it hasn't really been focused on the utility of apartments for people that we all love and want to participate with. I have a younger brother um, who's about 25, 26. He's currently living in California because he's in the Coast Guard, right? So hard to move to Idaho if you're in the Coast Guard. But he very much wants to move up here. Now, when he gets out of the Coast Guard, he won't have a lot of money to buy a house. And, you know, he's, uh, he's a young husband. And, you know, they're saving up aggressively and trying to make it happen. But he wants to move up. My dad recently moved into the area. She's like, I want to move up near you guys. Like, that'll be great. The point is, it's, I would love for him to be able to come up and rent something if he can't buy. And so he's not living far out. He's not living, for instance, in Boise or, or 30 minutes away or in any direction. And those are people that are awesome. Like, he's awesome. He'd be a wonderful addition to the community. He just won't be in a spot to buy something and there is a lack of single family housing that that is for rent. I mean, classically, you're gonna have to buy if you wanna have a single family home. And yeah, there are some places for rent, not a ton. That's a really important use case. And your mom is another one that I think is really neglected on the regular because you need proximity, right? If you're caring for somebody, you need them living close by unless you wanna you know, drive an hour round trip to fix the sound bar, which is not, which is not <laughs> ideal. Uh, a, um, a developer actually in the town I moved from in in California, this little town called Danville, very similar to Eagle. I remember talking to one of the town councilmen. He was actually he was a client of mine from years prior, but he had really made a name for himself because he had figured out a way to do a very nice apartment development for seniors right smack in the middle of downtown. And they had, you know, granite countertops. It was affordable for seniors, and people lost their minds positively because like this is what my mom has been needing this is what my dad has been needing and because it was centrally located in downtown they were able to walk to the grocery store they were able to walk to coffee they they could hit uh transit stops very very quickly and easy, easily and he figured out a way to make it financially viable mm -hmm. and people were so happy now they were not owning these apartments these were not condos these were these were rentals but they were designed for a very specific use and this gentleman had figured out a way figured out a way to make it happen you pointing out your mom it's like yes that's what we need too we need options or at least it sounds like we need options i don't i don't have an aging parent that needs an apartment so i can't speak for myself but i think that's a hallmark of a really good um plan that, that is catering to all levels of residents. Eagle has an older aging population as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And I love that you tell me this story because that's the best part about people moving here is they bring their ideas, they bring their food, their culture. I love hearing all the different things because when you grow up in a small little box, sometimes you can't think outside that box. Hmm. So thank you for sharing that story. That sounds awesome. We should get that developer to come up here. Yeah, Robert Storr, or Holler, Love it. get up here. Um, <laughs> I wish they would bring more food. I am dying. I mean, like Thai food's good, pho's good, a big fan. I mean, I had an incredible steak at Crave. That was great, great ribeye. But man, if you know a great Chinese spot, you got to let me know. That's what I'm looking for. But the Thai and sushi, man, I love that. Have you tried Boise Thai noodle? Yes. They're fantastic. Love the green curry. Yeah, the green curry is great. Red curry is great. Their presentation with the um, coconut milk soup as well is fantastic. It's this double layer thing, and I think they have like a sterno little heater at the bottom, so it stays warm the whole time. It's fantastic. You should I check it out. I saw that on somebody's table. I didn't know what it was. Yeah, it's delicious. It's the double tier thing. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, okay, so as far as development then, your position is, look, we need it all. We need to plan appropriately. You mm -hmm. can't say categorically no. Well, it wouldn't be wise, rather, to say categorically no to a specific type of housing development. Like, you can't say no apartments ever, you know, especially for people with, with uh, relatives they're caring for or young people in transition. Apartments are crucial. Absolutely. Great. I lived in them when I was in college. 
um, my mom lives in now. So it's kind of the bookends of our lives kind of are in apartments. Gotcha. Now, you, you started off talking, we were talking right before we turned on the mics. You were talking about collaboration. This is something you're hitting on. Collaboration seems to be a hallmark of what you think the city is lacking. Talk to me about this. Where do you see a lack of collaboration? Where do you see uh, opportunities for collaboration that are not being explored? That's that's a whole other podcast, my friend. Well, listen, <laughs> we got time. I have a great pot of tea here. So just hit me with what you got. Yay. Okay, so this city council has done away with the senior center, the parks um, folks, the arts folks. There's just been a lot of my way or the highway with this current administration. And that's definitely not collaboration. Everything I hear come out of the council is control. Um, So I think the biggest thing I would do is start bringing more people in. I don't think the mayor should be in charge of every single thing. I don't think they should be considered the CEO or the COO of the city. I think that we're a group and we should act like a group. And I don't want to live where somebody is controlling me and the CEO of my town. I understand the finances and all that probably need somebody to understand where that money goes, but that should be based upon the whole council. I think that transparency on where that money is actually trickling down needs to be more widespread. I hear a lot of talk about, oh, well, we don't have that position filled anymore because they left, so they're just talking to the mayor. Why don't we have that position filled? Why aren't we... If, if, there, if that's a bad position, maybe we need to revamp that whole department then. Or where is the problem? I don't like the fact that we don't have a bigger Parks and Rec presence. I don't like that the Arts Commission just kind of puttered out and changed. The biggest thing for me right now is the Senior Center. I was going to say, <laughs> why, why don't we hit the Senior Center and then we can talk about the, the arts because that was very – that was not great. Yeah. But talk to me about the Senior Center. So – My mom's primary community is the senior center. She lived in her other town for 50-some years. I ripped her out of that. So for her to establish new relationships and familiar bonds, that was where she went. She loved it. She got to play her cards. She got to eat. She was making friends. Uh, She went away on a trip to visit family, comes back, and realizes the senior center's closed. I couldn't find any information other than on next door, and it was a lot of misunderstandings a lot of it's closed the doors have changed the locks are changed but now we're meeting at the church like I couldn't get a real sense of what was happening so I drove to the senior center found a guy that had an apron on that said Eagle Senior Center I went and asked him hey dude what's up my mom came comes on these days for these things he says oh don't worry it's all still the same come on back she can do exactly everything she she wanted I was like oh okay well I guess the social media hype is just hype right Mom, everything's copacetic, head on down. So she's like, gets all dressed up and heads on down. <laughs> Comes back and she's pretty distraught. Nothing was the same. There, were, The events weren't the way they were supposed to. Like, it was supposed to be a pinnacle day and it wasn't pinnacle day. Um, it was supposed to be this on the menu and it wasn't that. So everything had totally changed even though he'd said everything was exactly the same. When you change something for vulnerable people, it gives them a... It, it puts them into a regression, and it's it's harder to get out of that. So consistency matters with people that are vulnerable, and that wasn't even considered when they did whatever it is they did. To me, it was a little drama hissy fit. They should have had a talk. I understand that there was a horrible accident with the, the VRT and a lawsuit and a tort claim and all this, but why did we have to shut down an entire community that so many people relied upon? So then my mom goes down to the church because we heard that that's where the senior centers were meeting. And that wasn't a consistent thing either. They were having to pull chairs out and rearrange tables. And, you know, imagine a 78-year-old woman trying to pull a chair out or a table out so she could play, um, play her favorite cards and see her friends. It, It was devastating for us and for her. It was actually the catalyst that had her move out of our house and move out of Eagle because that continuity mattered and we weren't getting that. If it had to change and and deviate from her norm, it should have been told months in advance, this is what we're doing. Hey, everybody, we're ramping up for a big change. 
Let's get ready for it. But you can't just take the rug out from underneath these people and expect everything to be okay because it's not. Yeah. Yes. I mean, <laughs> my grandmother actually uh, recently passed away. And I know, this is not Sorry. great. Um, and you're 100% right. She, you know, in her 80s and things for her, you could not change them. She needed, you know, her meals. She needed her groceries. She needed total consistency. And... You know, for you or I, if we had some social engagement, um, you know, they're like, hey, we're meeting over here. It's like, oh, God, I went to the wrong place. Here we go. Just flip the U-turn. But especially when people that, oh, my goodness, excuse me, are not in control of of their transit options at times. It's kind of like, look, this was like an hour to get here. Or this was this was not just jumping in the car and, and off we go. Mm-hmm. Hearing, hearing what went through too because again i've spoken with the the mayoral candidates without captain mark i haven't really gotten a great sense of you have the city of eagle offering the senior center or asking the senior center to come in and make a case for getting funding so they do and the eagle senior center provides them the documentation requested based on that documentation at that time they were given they were given some funds Years later, they go back and say, hey, you didn't tell us about this stuff, this other stuff. You had these assets. They didn't ask for assets, right? They asked Mm -hmm. for a profit and loss. And, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I I had a small business that was absolutely decimated over COVID, came to a complete screeching halt after almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I initially, on principles, like, I don't want to ask the government. I don't want to apply for the PPP, whatever. It's not my jam. And as time went on, I realized, okay, look. You have an obligation to your family. You may not like this on principle, but you're going to have to do something. So I did apply. They did not ask for my bank accounts. They asked for my profit and loss. They asked what was going on with the business. I told them. I gave them all the information, and they provided me some funding, which I greatly appreciated. Um, so the I don't know all the nuances, but I do know that at the time when they applied, they provided them sufficient documentation. So then now you have the city asking for that money back, right? And then you have the brouhaha with changing the door locks prior to the lease being over, add on to it that they install a video camera inside the premises without the permission of the tenant, the existing tenant. I don't care if it's 24 hours. I don't care if it's 24 months. Until you they have, they have vacated the property and handed over the keys, you don't get to mess around with that stuff. So now you have the senior center suing the back. It's a train wreck. What, as a city council member, would you do? Say you were in city council this second, right? Because I'm pretty sure what you would say if I asked you, what would you have done? You'd say not sue them, not kick them out. Am Mm -hmm. I accurate? Absolutely. Okay, great. But we're in this wrangle now. What do we do now, right? How do you, as a city council member, I wave my magic wand, you're on the council. How do you make this right or rectify or at least address the problems that you see today right now? First and foremost, I think I dropped the lawsuit. We're wasting money. You, well, I'm an Eagle Citizens. That lawsuit's costing me money. And like you said, the $100,000, yeah, that's a big chunk of change. I don't want to lose that. Um, but they provided the paperwork that they needed to. And it feels like if you were really concerned about $100,000, why didn't we go after that years ago? Instead, now we've got into this little petty thing worth changing the locks, taking their assets, putting in a creepy camera. That. I was very concerned when I heard about that. I asked mom not to go because I don't know where that camera is. I don't know what they're doing. Privacy. Anyway, so if I was there right now, I think I would see what we could do about getting out of the lawsuit. The other thing is I would restore the Eagle citizens who were doing the providing the services. I'd put them back in that building because we need that continuity. They had been doing it for 30-some years. They were accustomed to this population. It's an establishment. It's an institution in our community. It needs to be restored back to where it was. So those are the two biggest things I would do. That makes sense. That makes sense. It, what a what a rough situation. Interesting uh, perspective that I heard actually from um, Canada Hayden. He he's a big fan of parks, right? Parks and Rec. But he was also pointing out um, with relation to all of this stuff. We're going after I think roughly one hundred fifty thousand dollars 
for the senior center were arguing over the three hundred thousand dollars for the um, for, uh, police uh, police service, right? Public safety. So it's like one hundred fifty for the senior center, three hundred for public safety. And he pointed out, he's like, "But we're spending fifteen million on a sports complex, right? Like, where's this money going? It's not that Eagle doesn't have money; it's that." That there's just money allocated to different things. And here, you know, first responders and then the seniors are getting hammered for, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. Now, again, I like a few hundred thousand dollars. And I'm sure you do, too. Mm-hmm. But we're not running like a multi, multi million dollar, you know, city budget. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's enough money available to just reallocate things or and, and say fund the police services you know, fund the senior center or at least let that money go, what, whatever it may be? Or do you think that Eagle is in a position or coming to a position where we may have to change the tax structure in some way, either, you know, property taxes or sales, whatever it is. But do you think there's enough money so that we can continue offering a wonderful quality of life to people in Eagle with existing money? Or should we do, do we need to increase taxes at some point? It feels like we're spending a lot of money on a lot of things. So from the outside, you think, oh, we've got a lot of money out there. I would definitely want to reallocate and relook at some of the things we are spending that money on already. I'm a girl who grew up with two pennies that I could barely run to rub together. I want to count every single cent and see where it's going. So when we're putting in a shooting range at how many millions of dollars to put in a shooting range, and yet we're going after the senior center for $100,000, I have a lot of questions about where that is and where that's going. So before I talk about raising any money or t- raising taxes or anything, I think we need to look at where we're putting all that money right now and where we're putting our resources. We got an administration right now that's really suing how many different allocates, how many different places, Home Depot, um, the Arts Guy, the Senior Center. So we have money to sue people. I'd, I'd rather put that money towards, you know, putting in a park or paying for the police or the first responders. So so to answer your question, do we need to raise more funds or uh, generate more tax revenue? I don't know yet. I'd have to look at all where all of our pennies are going right now because it feels like they're going in a lot of different buckets that maybe we don't need to have. Right. Home Depot. <laughs> Love Home Depot, right? But I feel dirty shopping there because there's Ace Hardware, right, <laughs> in town, small business, you know, across from the post office. I'm like, oh, Home Depot. <laughs> and I have to go. But, you know, like that's kind of the nature of big box stores, right? They have a lot more uh, They have a lot more items and whatnot. What's the balance in your mind? Because everybody, I think everyone says, hey, mom and pop shops. Like, let's get more mom and pop shops. God bless them. And, yeah, they're great. Hope Blooms Flowers. Shout out. Love you. You're the best. Agreed. Right? I mean, Rib Shack. Love you. You're the best. <laughs> right next to each other. That's probably why I know them both. But the point is... Yeah, we want mom and shop, pop shops, but we have a reality of uh, generating tax revenue. Mm-hmm. How do you find a balance with that? How do we usher in consistent tax revenue and, yeah, want the mom and pop shops, but face the reality that, like, Home Depot pays us probably quite a bit in taxes, right? I mean, the, the Winco probably pays us quite a bit in taxes. I don't have the exact numbers. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, everybody likes Pet IQ and into it. Like, that's wonderful. These are homegrown businesses. Kind of hard to grow a business that big. Like, what are the odds that the continuing population of Eagle, you know, we have individuals who have the capacity to start something in their garage and grow it up. So how do we balance these things? How do we welcome in uh, a wide variety of businesses while still protecting and kind of holding space, if you will, for our homegrown businesses? I love it. That's the same question I ask a lot of people that are out there right now. Um, We have a lot of really awesome commissions and boards, like the Urban Renewal Commission. They that's their job is to help bring in those businesses and balance that. I love that there's a board that's that's affiliated with that because, yeah, I love going to Winco. It's nice, Um, but we've also had to change how we shop as a family. We since we're just up the hill from Ace, we go to Ace first. And if they don't have it, then we go to Home Depot. <laughs> Good for you. But it's it's the same thing. We need to have a balance of all of it. Just like with the housing. We're not going to get away from big box stores wanting to come around here because there's a lot of people around here. They're going to want to put a, a, a shop up. 
cool. Well, let's look at who that is. What are we getting out of it? Where is it going to be? Um, my brother actually owned a small business, so I know any tiny breeze in the air can change his profit for that day. And so I want to protect the mom and pop shops that we have here and make it an environment so that we can have more of them. I've been shopping downtown Eagle more and more, and there's some cool shops down there. And I don't want them to go away. I love being able to walk down and, and buy. I bought some bourbon syrup the other day. Oh, my gosh. It was so good. Where, where did you get that from? Yeah, right. Oh, they're going to be horrible. I can't remember their names. It's all right. I'll put a dis- – uh, listen, I want to know. I'll put, a, I'll put a note in the video description. You just find out <laughs> after the fact. Bourbon, bourbon syrup sounds damn good to it, me. It was really good. Yeah. So, yeah, I want to protect that. And I think that there's a way that we can work together with – I saw Pierce talking about how we have the big businesses on the outskirts of town, like Fred Meyer and sure. out there. And that all makes sense. That's where the big roads are. That's where the big box stores should go. So not saying no to any of that. I like their money. <laughs> right. So I think there's a way to make it all work. And with, we've got some smart people in this area that, that know how to, to work together and make that happen. You've lived in Idaho for quite a while. What do you think about In-N-Out? Do you think we should have the fourth or fifth In-N-Out in the area, or do you think we should have the absolute first? I don't think we should have In-N-Out at all. Oh, my God. Oh, cut it. Stop it. The whole the whole thing, it's over. Have you been to Golden Wheel? Have you been to The Onion? There's so many great mom and pa shops that make a fantastic burger. I've been to In-N-Out. But do they have animal style? Like, what do you mean? I've been to one In-N-Out one time in oh my whole my life. Oh, God. Okay, what what is this Golden Wheel? Right. I think it's gone now. It was on Fairview. Okay. Well, then, of course, I haven't been there. What right. was the other one? Um, the Onion. The Hungry Onion. Where's that? That one was in McCall. There's one in okay. Meridian. I can't drive two plus hours to get a burger. Okay. And the other one is gone. Bad Boy Burgers. Where's that? Fairview. Overland. I don't know. I know. I know. They're not an eagle. Okay. Wait. <laughs> Back up then. You're poo-pooing on my near, near and dear... <laughs> And you can't even name a good, like your top three spots for are burgers? either gone or hours away. Well, that's an old time I okay. for you. Why don't you want in and out Burger then? I don't know them. Put them, I do know that they have long lines and there's a lot of traffic. Why do you think that is? Because they're amazing. Absolutely. Put they're some, amazing. So let's put it out here where there's a lot of open space. Out here? Yeah. You want it in Dry Creek? Let's put it in Dry Creek. I would love. If there was an In-N-Out in Dry Creek, that would be the most profitable In-N-Out in the entire history of the world, of humanity. Oh, I God. love it. But you don't get the tax revenue. That's fine. I'll come eat your burger and find out if I like it or okay, not. Okay. Let's back up here then. <laughs> all right. We might have to cut all this. So right, you're, absolutely. <laughs> so you're – we jest, but you feel like there might be some businesses that – Although we would get – Eagle would get tax revenue, just don't fit Eagle. Oh, no. I, I was totally okay, just Okay, totally joking. Yeah. Okay. If, if there's Thank a place, if there's a place for In-N-Out. I was like, I in. can't run this episode. <laughs> if somebody's advocating for no In-N-Out, it, like I could stomach let's have the fourth In-N-Out. But saying no In-N-Out, I almost died. Okay. I just went so, fourth. That's a lot. Anyway. Yeah, no, lot. I'm not okay. saying no to it. Okay. So do you think that we should find a place, long lines, because um, Councilman Pike did say, listen, I want the first In-N-Out. And we'll put it on the on, on the freeway. We'll do the traffic pattern correctly. They do have long lines. Give me the palm trees, make it look however you want, but I want the first in and out. And wow. Mayor Pierce was saying, no, I don't want the first in and out. Let someone else get the first in and out. We want the fourth or fifth in and out. Let Eagle be for Eagle. What? And he, I don't think that was exactly what he was saying, that we want it to be the Eagle way. We don't want all these people coming into Eagle to get their in and out fix. What do you think? I remember when the ch- first Chick-fil-A came to the Valley. And what the traffic looked like. And after, now I think we've got four or five of them. And it's tapered out and it's fine. They just blend in like anything else. So if in and out can give us a lot of money and we can make it look good as far as traffic and safety. That's what I mean by look good. I am not a, a visual person as far as pomp and circumstance. So I don't care if it has the palm trees or a pine tree. Let them do right. them. Um But yeah, I'm fine with it coming if it was the right location, the right place, and we got a good deal out of it. I know eventually the traffic will subside like it did with Chick-fil-A. However, (laughs) I would want to really encourage the the mom-pa shops first and give them a spot. The um, the corner, the burger place on the corner of what's second in Maine in Idaho or in Eagle, 
that was a great place. We used to go and get twisty cones, and now it's gone. I think it's being turned into a Mexican place. So I know that it's not always sustainable. My brother's business was a bar and pub, so I know that the profit margins are very thin on that. So if we needed to get in a big name brand and we we get great tax and revenue and you get your favorite burger, dude, that sounds pretty good. Dude, yeah, the Flying Dutchman. Oh, it's a double-double protein-style, animal-style. Oh, it's so good. You have no idea what I just I really said, don't. do you? They're it's just okay. words. It's okay. I'm just making noise with my face. It's all right. Okay. Talk to me about the art commission because one thing that you said is, you know, we're suing Home Depot, we're suing the senior center, we're suing the art people. When I heard about the art commission, I actually reached out to Jim and it's like, look, what? I mean, if you want to come on and talk about this, and they, they had a lot of things going on, so it wasn't the right time. And then later on, he did reach out, but I didn't. I was like, look, I don't know enough about this and I'm going to feel really bad if, you know, weird stuff goes out and I was off. But now it's really like, I don't even necessarily need to know a ton about it to know that we're suing an art commission. And that to me seems, I mean, maybe there's a ton going on that's like, oh no, we absolutely need to sue them. But talk to me about this. Again, Magic Wand, you're you're on the city council right now. What do you do about the, the Rangel Warren today with the art commission magic wand the very first thing that would encompass Take everything a we've little talked bit, about a little bit closer oh, there, there, you there, there, there you go the biggest thing i would do with the magic wand i know we talked about the senior center and the arts but let me back up and tell you the real magic wand would be um a code of ethics put in place for our city staff and council and elected officials because it feels like we've got a lot of slightly unethical things happening people are feeling jilted they're leaving they're suing there's a lot of animosity as a social worker i had to abide by the code of ethics a lot of professions have code of ethics not just people dealing with mental health but the city of eagle has millions of dollars shouldn't we be watching where those dollars go and part of that is having um, an ethics board and commission so i think that's the first thing i would want to do and then talk to the arts folks. You did way better about reaching out than I did. I, I want to hear their story. I want to hear what's happening. Because, yeah, the biggest thing I heard is we no longer have it and we're suing them. That's the message. And that's a very unfortunate message. And whatever the nuances that we're missing with that would be great to weed out and to hear those details. But ultimately, why don't we have an arts person? Why aren't we being more collaborative and, and finding solutions rather than just kicking people out and suing people. Sure. So in ethics, I appreciate this. Where do you think in like practical terms or in, in the examples we've talked about, the city administration is lacking ethical decisions? Or let me rephrase. You think we need an ethic, essentially an ethics policy not because we're nailing it, but probably because it's wanting a little bit. Where do you see that, hey, this could be better? Like we could yeah, – that's the question. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of things that happen in secret, and it's hard to know if they're good or bad because they're in secret. So if we bring the light to them, then we can have an honest discussion about what's happening. So those secret things I talk about are, why did the council decide to annex Avamore? What was, who was benefiting who on what? Are people getting certain kickbacks? Are they making land deals? Oh, I sold this property and now I put it up for sale for my buddy over here who donated to my campaign and they're getting a better deal. Like there's a lot of things happening like that that, dude, we've got too much going on. I don't need to get into the nuances of all of it. I don't want to have to learn as a citizen who's scratching who's back and making money off of what. But it would be cool if we had an ethics board whose job it was to dig into that. Who is getting a benefit out of the park sky le or the art sky leaving? Who's benefiting from suing them? Where's the money coming from for those lawsuits? Where's the money that you paid in taxes going? Do we want that much money going to a park when maybe it should go to the police? Uh, you voted for this and, oh, gosh, golly, you got a huge campaign donation from that developer. Or now you're no longer on city council. You're going to go get a contract job working for that developer. Like those are the nuances that we as a public don't have the time to get into. And you're awesome for putting us on and doing all of this. But there's so much more that we'll never get to see the surface of. 
So why not have a board who's dedicated to looking at that? Why not put some code of ethics saying, hey, if you're going to post on Nextdoor as a council member, abide by these rules. Or, you know, if you want to post something about the city, here's the website to do it. And this is the mechanisms of which the city ethically would like you to post by. Just bringing things to the light and having somebody actually have a job to do that. Man, Charlie Bond's comment on Nextdoor was just, and again, I don't know. I, I stated this when I when I started the conversation with um, Councilman Pike. I don't know the accuracy about the things he he said, um, but I did realize really quickly. It's like this is not the right way to be doing this. It, you know, I think, and I I've actually spoken with several candidates about it. It's like if the mechanism for mass communication is literally going to next door for the city administration, <laughs> then we're screwing something up. I'm like, I, he could have come here. Like, I would be happy to donate studio time to counsel people who want to to get a message out. Like, it it just seems so not right, yeah. right? And and it, it doesn't yield the best results because it's almost like a pylon instantaneously, right? And then people... It was was what it was. He did, but he did do that, right? Mm-hmm. He did go to next door. What did you think about his comments? And what do you think about him going on to next door to make those comments? Dude, I love information. Give me all the information any which way I can get it. Him putting those novellas, so to speak, on next door was great to see his perception or perce- perspective. Perspective. Thank you. <laughs> I like to make words up, so thank you. Um I liked hearing what he had to say. I, it felt dirty and wrong to read it there. It felt very voyeuristic. Um, I did not like when he wouldn't address every single comment. He would pick and choose which comments to comment on. But that's getting into the weeds. Like, why does he even have to do it that way? Maybe that's the, the new town hall that we're in. Maybe that's where we as a society need to go. But it doesn't feel right. Um, I think that we need to have some great ideas from people who are in media like this is a cool venue and i'm sure there's a lot of other great ideas on how we as a city can broadcast our message and get feedback from the community at the same time in a fair accurate and enlightening way but next door doesn't feel like that's the place (laughs) right right and uh, yeah i was just i was actually really bummed for him i was like oh that stinks but I, i mean you you i hate I hate the idea that somebody has something very important and near and dear to them, and then they go to like Facebook to express it. You know, it's like that's not the place. And then the pylon, it's like, are you even human, or are you like a Russian bot, or like what? <laughs> I've done, I've done obviously a lot of things on on YouTube, and you get, you just get crazy people, and and people that if you reach out to them, like, hey, would you like to come and talk about this, or do you want to like jump on a phone call? Because I think. You know, I, I, it seems like you're very impassioned. You're saying a lot of stuff. You're just saying it the wrong way, right? Like you're commenting in the bottom of this video and it's like, why don't we just talk or, you know? Yeah. So I, I would like to see Eagle increase their communication for sure. And I'm not even a resident. I'm just like, we need to, you got to do better, <laughs> better than that. <laughs> um, we've been talking for a while. We've talked about a lot of things. Do you have anything that we're missing that you really want to express. Oh, you're so kind. I just want to say I'm so grateful for this opportunity to run. I'm grateful to meet all the people I've met and heard from. I think the one thing I've learned the most is we have such amazing talent and passionate people in this community. And I'm saddened to hear their stories of how they've been ostracized and shut down. I'm frustrated that we aren't more opening to more voices at the table we had a great city with a lot of departments that were filled in and now they're vacated Um, so i guess my biggest thing is i'd I'd really want people to feel like they're engaged and their voice matters and i'm here to help amplify those voices i want to make more transparent communication happen and i've got a website if people want to come and ask me questions i would love that i'd love to meet with people because like you said the further away we get from a face-to-face, the the more robotic we become and the meaner we are. So to get to talk to people is amazing. And I think we find we have a lot more in common than, than not. It's they who decided to, to, to divide us. We shouldn't be dividing ourselves. We're all neighbors. We're all in this together. Let's, let's work like adults and work together. 
Yeah. And you actually, I did want to make note of this. You're the first person who's actually brought up, why do we have vacancies in jobs? Why do we have openings that aren't being filled? Is it the problem with the job? Is it the problem with the employer? Right? Like what's going on in the city so that people are leaving and we're not able to fill those spots, right? Because if we have an actual need and it's an appropriate job and the pay is appropriate, then, you know, generally those jobs just get filled. But identifying that and figuring it out, why are people leaving, Mm -hmm. right? Is it what's going on? I think that's, uh, I think that's an important piece. Well, thank you for taking the time. Nonsense. Thank you. I appreciate you. And (laughs) Win, lose, or draw, I really appreciate that you're bringing things to light and, you know, especially the code of ethics. I think that's – you're the first person who's mentioned that and I think you have good reason and and it would be awesome to see Eagle improve and be an awesome community, not just, you know, financially but also really on a, on a local government level. Well, thank you and thanks for this platform. It's awesome. Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by mtustudios.com. If you're looking to start a podcast or make content for any level of your business, MTU Studios can help. Just reach out to us today and we can start shooting tomorrow.